Okay, I guess we are ready to go. Uh, camera seems to be on, it's blinking red, so let's get started. Uh, yeah, welcome to our talk, uh, which uh, is going to be about ArangoDB running on Mesos. So, um, maybe just as a background information for the history of ArangoDB and Mesos, it's been like a really long relationship, and those guys uh, have been really, really helpful in helping us to develop stateful frameworks because they were basically the first framework who were really running on uh, those stateful primitives in Mesos. And you'll also see more about that throughout the presentation, but this is kind of like well, we have a really close relationship between uh, Mesosphere, DCOS, and Mesos and the Arango guys. And this is actually also why I'm here. Uh, I'm Jörg with Mesosphere. You might have seen me this morning already. And I'll give this presentation together uh, with Kunal and Claudio from ArangoDB. And uh, I would actually, do you want to get started? Sure. sure. Thank you, Jörg. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Kunal Kusurkar. I'm a Director of Solutions Engineering at ArangoDB. I joined pretty recently, but I have a history of working in the NoSQL big data events processing, messaging, ESP, ESBs over my career over the last 12 years. So with that, let me quickly give it to Claudius for his introduction. We can start. Sure. Uh, yes, my name is Claudius Weinberger. I'm the CEO of WangaDB. I founded the company together with my co-founder four years ago, but we started the project, let's say, five, five, five and a half years ago. And we're building databases now for 18 years. So we did a lot of different stuff, customer, uh, customized solutions and so on. And 2012, we sit together and thought about, should we build another database? There are already a few on the market. But you will see later that we found something, what we call the native multimodal approach, but from our perspective, adds something new to the market and uh, gives us more possibilities. Thank you, Claudius. So let me start off by asking a question. Why distributed data to begin with? Can anybody? Good? Or am I soft? OK. Huh? Perfect. So why distributed data? That's a question I really want to start this conversation off with. Of course, the topic of today is distributed data on distributed infrastructure. So I'm taking the first part and starting off there. The question really stems from the challenge that what we saw over the last decade or so, if you see and track history, what you would see is we have seen a significant amount of growth in global web cloud deployments and mobile applications. And that brought with it over a period of next, I would say over the last decade plus, it brought an unprecedented amount of data with it in terms of volume, in terms of velocity, and in terms of variety, and a combination of those together brought in a certain level of combination pressure that really pressured our existing database systems. In other words, the database systems that we know, the relational databases that we know and have worked well, loyally for us for a long time, were just not suited because they were not made for it. The, exist the newer applications that we were building had a completely different requirement in terms of these three Vs and any and all combinations thereof. So what was the frustration? And then what happened overall was the attempts, as it always happens, is to figure out how are we going to solve that problem? What do we do to solve the three Vs problems that we have? No matter how much hardware you give or how much you optimize it, the monolithic backends just wouldn't scale up to that challenge to solve it. They were made for a different era with a different purpose for different systems that were siloed at that time and to work on a limited data set overall. They were really not made for voluminous data. They were not made for a variety of data. They were not made for data with high throughput and high amount of reads. That is essentially, then at that point, what was realized, well, the solution really lies in a way to think different, to think what is really the missing part to solve that problem. And distribution was that answer and following that distributed data. Fundamentally, what solved that problem, or what really attempts to solve that problem now in the modern world, is a database, is a native multimodal database that will fulfill, the, that will provide a solution in three ways. One, be able to store and serve a variety of data. That's the word 
multi-model, meaning you should be able to store any kind of data, the new applications, the web applications, mobile applications, they're not really just working on relational data. They're working on documents, they're working on key value stores, they're working on graph data, and all of that data needs to be used continuously as the applications are being built and as they evolve. And also between them, which means you at one given day, your application might want to just use a lot of document stores on a given month or after a few cycles of development where you realize, well, my data is more connected, it's more relationship, I'm trying to analyze relationships more than query entities. Well, I need to switch to a graph data model. The existing databases just don't allow you to do that. You need a fundamentally new database that's at the core designed for it organically. And that's the word, that is what makes it organic multi-model, native multi-model database, which will support documents, which will support key value stores, which will support graph data structures to begin with. That is the first way to solve the variety of data problem. Now, once we attack that, the second is the ability to scale out across multiple machines to handle the velocity needed, to handle the generally great amount of throughput that's asked of you to solve the number of write operations and number of read operations in a given day. You need to be able to be up for that challenge of solving. Third one is the ability to spread out across machines when you need to handle volumes, your data set is not going to stay the same when you start your mobile business or a web business, and two years down, four years down, you're going to see exponential growth in the amount of data you're handling. And you cannot solve that by scaling up machines, giving more memory to you know, make buy bigger machines and absorb a higher cost of ownership. You need to spread it out, spread the data out over commodity hardware on multiple machines and tackle the volume problem as well. And this database exactly attempts to do that by attacking the very need of distributed data. With that, let me introduce ArangoDB. So as I spoke, those were the characteristics, the challenges, the realizations upon frustrations and the solution approach. A database like ArangoDB defines it, we start off with that value proposition, attacking that problem, a native multi-model database that will provide a unified declarative query language, a simple words, a single query language to query graph information, to query document information, to query key value information, whatever information you store at a database, in the database. Scalable and highly available with configurable consistency. At times you need acidity, you need strong consistency. Other times you're probably okay with asynchronous replication. You're okay with getting a dirty read back because that's what your application needs at that time and you should be able to tune and change it as you need. Extensibility, and then lastly I would say, ability to expose your database operations over a microservice framework. The ability, your mobile applications, web applications, they need, they're essentially built with the idea of microservices. Your data tier over, over these years have not evolved as much. ArangoDB solves that. We expose the database operations using an HTTP REST API, and that API is also extensible using the Fox microservice framework. And you can write service manifest that will go and push directly the information you write and read from the database exposed as microservices. All together really becomes a modern database that you can use to service your microservices based applications. I'll take a brief pause here before I go a little bit deeper and explain each of these features to you. Any questions I can uh, answer in the meanwhile? Any quick questions? Yeah. All right, so multi-model. I'll go ahead and explain what I mean by that. As I was talking about different kinds, the V, the variety of data, these are all the different types that we have in the market right now. There are point solutions to solve point problems. Historically, like we have seen the relational world, right? Relational tables that were built to solve order systems, catalog systems. But there were other data types that evolved. There were documents, there were graphs, there were columnar stores, time series, key value databases, all of these different kinds of model. ArangoDB is an attempt to solve that problem really well, and we have taken the approach to solve, be a native multi-model database, to do two, three things really well. Absorb graph-like information and serve it back really well. Absorb documents, absorb key value stores, all in a single deployment artifact. And what I mean by that is a single engine, a single daemon that will encapsulate all this functionality and also provide you the freedom to run 
on all of this on a scale out infrastructure which mesos can handle so what do you get with it you get a unified query language for all these models you get a clutter free simplified cluster deployment scaling you get a native multi model advantage overall and what it gives you from a developer standpoint what's the advantage what's the value that you're going to get out of it a significantly reduced operational moving part overhead right there is not much of an operational trouble that you will have to deal with unlike systems that you have seen probably there is hadoop zookeeper most of these if you're familiar with these technologies bring in a lot of operational clutter even databases like cassandra and others they will bring a lot of operational pain for you to to deal with over a period of time we attempt to solve that with that with a simplified artifact that you can deploy and deploy across multiple machines and still serve the same workloads without you having to create a new point solution every single time faster development cycles with a unified query language a single query language you can query all the information stored in all these different types and even join them with a simple pseudo code like language that's a huge advantage from a development cycle from a time to development perspective and lastly richer quality applications with multi model with attacking three v's that we spoke about you will definitely get an overall advantage in term of building a high quality mobile application because you have a microservices layer that's really at a data tier you don't have to deal with it have to work with it at an application or a front end side it's really done at a data tier side for it scaled accordingly as we will scale the data for you a significant advantage you'll get out this is a slightly expanded picture of how things will get deployed from a distribution standpoint these are the different roles how we will deploy arango db the data itself is kept on db servers whether primary or secondary distributed across machines the microservices can be exposed using the fox microservice framework which will run on the coordinator nodes as well coordinator nodes can be scaled independently from the db server nodes which means you get computational scalability as well as you get data scalability based on what your application needs are to service your requests and lastly the agency is really the consensus mechanism that we have which will do the job of stepping out of the cluster and overlooking it like a hawk and figuring out how are my coordinators working how are my machines doing how are my db servers doing and how is health of everyone if anybody goes down it will make sure that it gets automatically started on different machines or that is a process that you can automate in a, in the way you feel best as well it is essentially a very hardened way of figuring out what your cluster state is and tackling it as as you as you as your needs grow up oh, that is one more second so and this is actually where mesos is coming in as you can see this is like a very complex architecture which i have to deploy and actually also maintain because we're talking distributed systems there are failures each of those instances might fail at any time because the underlying node is crashing because there is a network partition so this is why we actually uh have to do something about how we deploying it and as we all know we're at mesoscon mesos is really built for that but the seemingly the Con HDMI connection isn't really built for it. Uh, for we see already like network partitions happening here between the laptop and Beamer, so it's going to happen even more in this big cluster over here. Um, yeah. So and this is actually why the Arango guys started out pretty early, talking to us in developing like a Mesos framework for it, and. Developing such kind of Mesos framework is actually it's really really hard, especially we're talking here about a database. Developing something, I don't want to say even like Marathon because Marathon also has like a lot of moving parts uh, by now. But in the beginning, it was actually quite simple because it had very little state. But here we're actually talking about a stateful framework which has to be resilient. And so in the end, you don't have to read all of this, but kind of like the outcome was that we wrote uh, about uh, 5,000 lines of C++ code just to maintain all states. And I think this picture is even symbolizing it better because this actually shows the state diagram we had for all those components. So in Mesos itself, there are like low-level primitives for those of you who have, might have looked at it. It's reservations um, and then um, dynamic volumes and so on and so persistent volumes so it was actually it was a rather a lot of code we needed to write here and maintain but now it's actually it's a pretty good framework and maybe this is also like one of those 
key takeaways from writing it. If you really dare to write a framework yourself, I'll tell you on the next slide why you shouldn't. Uh, you should actually start out with a um, like state diagram like this, how you want to deal with your persistent volumes. Next slide. But as said, you actually you shouldn't be writing your own framework in most cases. Just quick raise of hands, how many of you have either been to the SDK talk or have been to the uh, SDK workshop even? So yeah, you know all of this. So the basic idea is that uh, we don't want people to actually have to write frameworks. We want to generate it for them. And this is what the SDK is actually about. So the simple thing we also did, for example, in the workshop, we don't have to do anything. We just have a very simple YAML configuration and uh, we can deploy it. So we don't need any deep knowledge about DCS. We don't need any deep knowledge about the framework we are uh, want to run, we simply say run these commands and then the framework will auto-generate uh, such kind of framework scheduler for us. In most cases, also if we're dealing with like a database where we have certain startup constraints or certain recovery operations, it might happen that we actually have to write some code. So uh, with the SDK currently, this is some Java code and I need like a little understanding of DCOS. But all of those up here, this is actually, this is something I can probably, the highest, uppest layer, the default, I can do that within a week. This is probably somewhere within months. And how long did it take us to develop the entire framework? Like nine months or so? Yeah, rough, yeah. Um, so that's actually a whole lot different time scale of developing such kind of code. But thank you for, again for doing it. It was really, really helpful because it actually helped us uh, build the SDK with all the experience we got from this. Uh, next slide. And now let's actually, we talked about the uh, replicated data part. Now let's just talk about like the replicated infrastructure part. Once the slide is not black anymore. Next slide, yes. Um, so we're talking about data center replication and actually we have multiple options for that. So maybe we should first clarify what we're talking about. So we can either use replication or our goal could be to use replication just as like an offsite backup from where I might be able to restore my data. So this is option number one. Uh, option number two is a little stricter requirements. This is like disaster recovery where I actually want to switch over to my uh, backup. So my backup has to be something which can run and also serve queries in the end. And the latest and probably strictest uh, goal or option could be to offer uh, geolocal services and distribution of data. The Beamer is really fun. Um, so uh, in that case that I can actually serve queries from both data centers in parallel, uh, which is good, for example, if I have customers around the world uh, but it's, of course, it's also a lot harder because all of a sudden I'm really dealing with hot master-master replication. So uh, basically, like the basic idea here is we have a cluster one, a cluster two, and some other zone, and now we want to see how we can actually uh, get that going in which different uh, scenarios up there. Next slide. Yeah, so, and for the first iteration, uh, a RangoDB, uh, after also discussing with us, we decided to go for just to solve the first two options because for many people that's actually sufficient. I don't necessarily have that much load uh, that I need uh, multiple sites uh, serving requests. So actually just being able to recover my data is something very useful if a data center is going down, uh, if an Amazon region isn't available anymore, for example. Uh, next slide. And so what we decided uh, as like the goals for this first iteration is to run a database uh, clusters in all data centers involved in this replication procedure and then replicate data automatically. This is nothing what I want to do as an operator. This is something which should happen out of the box. And uh, then also be prepared to actually switch over to the other data center. So, uh, at time point one, all requests are going into data center one. Then a hurricane is coming, uh, as unfortunately it's happening too often in recent days. Uh, that data center is offline, power is cut, and I can actually switch over the request to the second data center, and then I can still keep on serving uh, 
queries uh, from the second data center. So uh, the first implementation uh, we are currently implementing, or they are currently implementing, um, is to have this replicated uh, ArangoDB cluster, which includes basically all user settings. So the user settings they are also replicated between both clusters. And um, Arango already has a replication API, so we can we will utilize that together with a newly written tool called Arango Sync. And then we actually, we looked into different options and what we can use to uh, yeah, ship the data over. And we looked at different implementations or how much effort it would be to do it ourselves. And our decision was actually to use uh, Kafka, or more particular called Kafka Mirror Maker, which allows me to run like a distributed, replicated uh, Kafka cluster across two data centers. Um, and that decision is actually, it's kind of, if you looked at all the other talks, and this is also why this talk is actually in the Smack stack, uh, because of a lot of those architectures are starting to use other tools, as for example, Kafka. Here we have, uh, if you're talking about the Smack stack, here we would replace the uh, storage part with ArangoDB. Uh, but it's basically, we not necessarily have to write all the tools ourselves because we have not 2017 a really great toolbox available uh, of tools to use. And so we use that and this helps us to uh, write load spikes in, in one data center because uh, Kafka can also queue them so it can just accumulate uh, events as well and uh, it can then distribute them across data centers, and even if there is a network outage, we might lose some of the events in there, but it's still gonna be running, and uh, Kafka can also reconnect. Another nice thing is that we can actually, uh, or natively implement, we don't have to do anything to very little to get that, is to implement back pressure, meaning if the second database is getting too slow, uh, the second data center and just can't handle all the requests, uh, Kafka can just buffer that and we have automatic back pressure and we can even then pass it on to the uh, tooling around Arango Sync uh, to uh, further have further back pressure and not overload the Kafka cluster. Uh, the TLS protection, uh, it's we're shipping that across data centers, so probably across some communication line where someone else might be listening. So uh, we need to make sure that all of this is encrypted. Uh, next slide. And so this is then basically, this is similar to the picture before. So just this, these lines, they are basically, uh, this is a Kafka connection. And uh, so Arango Sync is just making sure uh, at which time point we are or how much we have replicated, and then basically the Kafka is sending us over the data uh, we are still missing as events. Um, and that allows us, if that data center, data center A is failing, we might lose some of the events uh, which have not been replicated yet by Kafka, so which are, might be in the DB server, but have not been written yet in Kafka, slash might have even been written to Kafka, but haven't been mirrored yet to the second Kafka instance. For most use cases, this isn't a too big issue, but it's just something you should be aware of in the first implementation. Uh, next slide, please. So, and this is actually also the limitation, and it's basically that it's asynchronous. So, as said in the beginning, uh, this is targeting the first two goals of just having a backup and having a data center to which I can switch over. Uh, but it also has the advantages that we quickly get an implementation which helps to solve those first two use cases. But it uh, can help in unplanned outages uh, to losing some of the events in the queue. Uh, I say unplanned because actually if we plan our outages, if we plan to take one data center offline, uh, because we want to migrate nodes, we want to, I don't know, create a new cluster, then we can actually just wait until the Kafka queue is entirely depleted and then switch over. So in that case, we can actually uh, do without data loss. And yes, it's asynchronous, as said in the beginning, we don't have any load balancing of queries, so no master-master, we can't query both clusters in parallel. Next slide. And yeah, that's actually, it's a good, topic to just talk about what are like the 
current ways and plans for DCUS uh, replication across data centers because uh, the same problem you actually have, will have for many clusters that you want to distribute that across different data centers or across different uh, Amazon availability zones, avail uh, Amazon regions. And you have some options. So the first one could be that you actually start spreading out your masters across those different data centers, across those different zones. And that actually works uh, rather well if you're staying in the same availability, uh, if you're spreading out across different availability zones, but stay within the same region. Once you start, so this is like Amazon talk, if you're thinking about your own data center or Azure or GCE, you just have to translate it to the uh, respective uh, names there. It basically, it tells you, you can't spread them out across low latency links, but not across high latency links. And why is this the case? This is mainly Zookeeper. Once you start spreading out a Zookeeper cluster across high latency uh, links, you'll end up in some issues, so you should be very careful with that. And that's actually also one of the reasons why Ben in his keynote yesterday mentioned that we want to get rid of Zookeeper, is just to make that more scalable across high latency links. Uh, the easy thing to spread out is actually agents. So we have a lot of uh, users who are spreading out either uh, Mesos agents or DCS agents uh, across, for example, there were at least one talk today about uh, using spot instances, and they don't matter too much whether they have a high latency in between or not, so there are even people running their on-prem data center and then extending that with uh, spot instances for uh, spiky workloads. Because there isn't any synchronous communication required, it's all asynchronous, so uh, latency doesn't impact it too severely, at least. Um, the plans for the future are also to actually be able to link two clusters together. In the beginning, it's just going to be uh, UI, CLI, so mostly like control. It's going to make it easy to control two clusters in parallel. Uh, but uh, so there are people working on like a linker module, it's called, which makes it like those clusters aware of each other, that it actually makes it very easy to support use cases like that. Uh, next slide, which I guess is a demo, yes. This is a demo. So we can talk a lot about it. I'll just spin up the cluster for you and then you can take over, okay? Sure. So uh, we can talk a lot, but let's actually just see also what a RangoDB can do. We obviously, for time reasons, we won't spin up two clusters and uh, have the replication in between. Also, as this is not quite working yet, so we'll just show it to you on a single distributed uh, cluster instance, but already distributed within one data center. So, installing a RangoDB is quite easy. Uh, ah. The only thing we have to look out for is that there are actually two instances. So, a RangoDB is actually the old one. We should add a prefix to that probably, but we want the new version, a RangoDB 3, so we are installing that. And uh, let's just have a look what's happening in the background because for those of you who might not be that familiar, uh, we see here the first thing spinning up. If we look at it, this is actually the framework scheduler. So the framework scheduler, this is a thing of which will deploy other, uh, afterwards all the other tasks. And this is running now, so rather soonish we should actually see the other tasks spinning up. This is also why it's still unhealthy because, yeah, the other tasks are still staging. And so these are now the actual uh, tasks which are doing the work. The first one is kind of like the controller who's controlling all the other tasks in Mesos terms, the framework scheduler. And then the other tasks, that'll be the DB servers and controllers uh, starting up. While they slowly come up, we could actually check whether we can already access the UI. You're a pessimistic. Well, the coordinators are missing. Hmm? Now they are on the hmm? wild. All right. Service unavailable because the coordinators are not quite there yet. Just wait for one more second. <laughs> Distributed systems take time, but it's still deploying. So let's just wait. Au revoir. 
No, you need to click on that little icon. Yeah, no. Hmm? Thanks. Quick. Just switch back. Do you want to tell more about the demo you'll be running? No. Oh. Now we are coming up. Ah, perfect. So, thanks, Jörg, for all the stuff you told about, about our asynchronous multi data center replication. But what I want to show you a little bit is the RangoDB cluster running on DSUS. So, first of all, we spin up with two clicks a cluster on a free nodes. DCOS cluster, per default you're getting two DB servers, two coordinators, and if you just want to add a new one, it's really one click, let's say, and you start another coordinator in the cluster, and what you can already do in the same time is maybe start a collection. A collection in RoyangoDB is the same as a table in a relational database, and you can really define for every collection First of all, the number of shards, so that's at the end limited uh, scaling. At the end, you need one shard at every DB server. And the other thing is the replication factor. And that is also configurable on every collection. So let's start with two for the demo. Yeah. This is funny. So now we have this collection. This is empty yet, so we can just put in some information Let's say uh, some my own key in that case, and then just adding some uh, JSON code here. So I'm not used for English to use an English key. You just want to tell me what I should type? Uh, just a name, it, just a short JSON document. Yes, test, and then the value. Like this? Yeah, sure, fine. Just save. <laughs> okay, that's funny. I'm just a very useful code monkey. <laughs> wow, sorry. So if you go back to the cluster overview, then we can also directly have a look at the nodes and also on the shards. So we created this collection. We see now all the potential shards and now I can also move the shards around in the cluster. For example, if I want out of some reason manually clean up one of the server to maybe do some maintenance on that, I can easily do that on the web interface, but also via our RESTful API. That's all possible against the framework and so on. And what is also possible then if I want to have three nodes of the DB server, let me also show that as the last short thing in, in the demo. That maybe takes now a little bit more because a DB server is already a little bit more to start than just a coordinator. Maybe also to explain that on the coordinators. The coordinators are completely stateless. They only do the first phase of the query optimization, the query handling in the direction of the application, and also do this FOX, the Microsoft frameworks. And as you can this is something that is at the end complete stateless. You can have 10 of them, hundreds of them. It really depends how much you use these features. And if you lose one of them, it makes no difference at all. So now we have three DB servers. Let's go also on them. In another collection and make a replication factor now three because I have the possibilities for that. Oh, sorry. Test as well. Okay. And if we go back to the notes, now we have the two collections. And you see we have a replication factor of two. That means we have now spread it over the cluster, the leader and the two followers over all the three nodes. And now it's from, for example, it's not possible to scale down the cluster to one node. You should think about it. Normally, this would be not possible. But it's something where we say it's up to you if you want to do that or not, because it means that you're at the end, in a situation where you have the leader and the two followers only on two nodes. So in the sense of a high availability, it makes maybe not so much sense, but it's something 
even if you need that for maybe scaling up the machines or use bigger machines for your cluster, it should, it's still possible. Um, maybe also give you a short example of the query language. Um, So that is also very simple. At the end, it's very similar to SQL. You can do something like a four, like a loop in some sense of a collection with documents. Then you're filtering on some stuff, and then you make the projection of the result at the end of the uh, of the query. So maybe that is also the, the 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 main difference between SQL and AQL at the end. But what you can also do with uh, AQL is to combine different um, 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 different stuff what we're offering. We can do graph queries and joins and document lookups really in one query. So we have really use cases where people start with a graph database and then the optimization at the end, if you use a RungoDB, is to use the combination from joins and graph queries at the same time. So it's a sample what we're always saying is if you have a fixed length in your path, if you make a query or a graph traversal, it's more efficient to use a join instead of a graph traversal. If you really can combine that in one query, then you get really new possibilities in the direction, what is the performance, what you're getting out of the stuff. Also, so, so also we're offering sub-queries. It's a really complex query language, but you can really combine the different stuff. So maybe let's go back to So we are still trying to bring down the number of uh, shards. And uh, to be honest, I missed something to tell you as, uh, at the beginning. We changed that. You cannot scale down the cluster until you have the free replication factors. So let's about that. Go back to the collections. Just delete the collection with the replication factor of free. Go back to the notes, then let's have a look at the chart. We have only the one collection with the replication factor of two, and try the same again. And now it's possible to get out one of the DB servers of the cluster. So that is the difference but why we choose our own framework in DSOS. We really can take care of all the stuff. If we want to take out one server, it's no problem. The framework will move the data, if possible, to the other nodes. If it's not possible, it will protect you that you don't come in a situation that makes not so much sense. And now let's maybe, maybe take a little bit before it's the, the agency recognized that you have moved the data and so on. It's what Jörg already mentioned also with the agency. That this is a rough based um, um, key value store where we really hold the state of the cluster. And if you change something, it's more or less like a changing of a plan in the agency. And then we have a supervision code, what really then makes sure that all those things happens. And that's also once on the leader of this raft-based um, key value cluster. So it's sure that it's only once, once a time. So now you see we have getting out one of the DB server of our cluster, and the data are still in the way how we need it. So it's only on DB server one and three, we take out number two. So, some questions on that. So that's maybe for now, for a short demonstration, should be good. Especially as we're running out of time. Especially that, yes. How many of you have used either a graph database or a document database before? How many of those databases were RangoDB? Okay, half, 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 okay. Uh, so for me, it's actually, it's really, so my background is actually databases, like my PhD was on distributed databases back in Germany, and I really like all those, all databases, or all the databases which I allow themselves to call databases. And so I think this is a really interesting space, and just from what I see when talking to uh, customers and users, make sure that you choose the right database, the right data model for your application. 
uh, because it actually it matters a lot how you model your data and how you get your data into uh, those different systems. So just seeing so many customers doing that mistake, please think about which database to choose and then also how you to fit your data into that specific database, into this specific data model. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>